was during my later school years that I spent the summers recutting and repairing sails in front of other people's boats. Uh, a cruising boat or ocean racer would come into the harbor uh, after a race with some torn sails and uh, would ask the club launchman how they could get it repaired and they, and they would say, we'll go up and see Ted Hood and he can probably handle it for you tonight. And I very often worked evenings uh, on some of these repair sails so they could leave the harbor the next day and continue their cruise. The most interesting part of it was taking an older sail or one that was unsatisfactory from another sailmaker and recutting it and perfecting it to make it a useful, good-fitting sail. You learn very fast this way. I started making sails from scratch in about 1947. I used to roll up the carpets in the living room floor, the only area large enough to get a sail, say, 20 by 10 feet in, lay it out and cut it, and then take it up to the bedroom and do the stitching. Some of the larger sails at this time I had to take out to uh, the dance hall, the Corinthian Yacht Club, or Abbott Hall dance floor or the high school gymnasium, which involved a lot of cleaning in order to get the floor presentable for a clean sail. I'd lay the sail out on the floor, pack it up, and take it home to stitch on an old adapted machine, something my grandmother had had most of her life. We started weaving our own sailcloth because of all the difficulties we had obtaining good quality and consistent quality fabric from others. I used to run the looms during the day while making the sails and could keep them running quite constantly all day long, making major adjustments with the help of a loom fixer on Saturdays. We now have over 40 looms all weaving various kinds of sailcloth from 3 ounce to 14 ounce at least a dozen different varieties. We adapted the looms specially for weaving narrow fabric, 18 inches wide, as we found we could get much better control in the weaving and finishing, and this could be tailored into a much better shape-holding sail. be done by hard, rugged hand sewing, like the clue of a sail, where you have to force the needle through 15 layers of fabric with a palm and needle to attach a fitting to which you can attach the sheets to trim the sail. And this is great security when you're out in a race knowing that you can do what you want to the sails. Strap it in flat if the boat's going fast and not have to worry about taking the sail off. Only hand sewing is strong enough to take this strain.
first new things we came out with on sales was in the spinnaker. We developed a crosscut spinnaker which has the, the seams running crosswise. We found that the crosscut spinnaker had a wider, more projected area to the sail. In other words, more projection to the wind. A flatter cut sail for a given area of material. This would pull the boat faster when running and when reaching close to the wind because of its flatness would also make the boat go faster. Will, are those leeches a little slack up there for a uh, for very light air? I mean, that's a little more wind than you'd normally be using it in. Yeah, well, it looks like they almost need a little more tightening now. That's a pretty flat sail for a floater. No, but I mean, you need the fullness to support it in the light air, where, you know, in a breeze, the, you can, the wind will blow the shoulders right out nice and flat, but... This is one of, uh, one of our new floater spinnakers they're trying out now, while the air is still light. Develop out of some very lightweight fiber. The first one we made after several years of development was for the 12 meter Intrepid. Although they didn't use it and have the chance to use it too many times in the series, there was one occasion when they took down their regular chute and put this up. It was just enough to pull him out of the hole and, and open up a two-minute lead. flatness of a crosscut spinnaker is most clearly demonstrated when looking at the sail sideways to the wind in a profile view. When the spinnaker is set correctly, the shoulders will be filled out to their maximum, the clues will be the same height, and the center seam of the spinnaker will be parallel to the mast. If the pole is too high, the top of the sail will collapse and not hold air. The luff of the sail will cave away from the boat. To overcome this, the sheet is trimmed in, cupping the leech of the sail into the mainsail. When the pole is too low, the projected area of the sail is reduced. The luff of the spinnaker becomes much too tight. to get the best all-around mainsail. Uh, I would suggest maybe, uh, although you get the aspect ratio penalty, it would be better to have the long luff, maybe drop his boom, keep the headboard up, uh, and shorten the boom so he gets the same rated area, taking the long batten penalty so we can develop a real good big roach. I think it's better to shorten the boom a little and have the big roach, the area of the sail up in the air where it really is more effective than down on the boom. Of course, Ted, and I want to remember this customer, it's, it's the Mediterranean area, and he's uh, it's generally light air performance. Well, that's we've right. We've got to consider this. Well, I think that's why we want to keep the big roach in the area up high and have a nice full sail. The extra area gained by building just as large a roach as possible on the edge of the sail is very important. This extra roach gives added free sail area, which will make the boat go faster. It also requires better material to withstand the strains and it is necessary to make constant adjustments with leech lines, boom bangs, and so forth to get the most out of this free area. And no sheeting problems. Uh, well, we want to put the two zippers on the foot. We'll have one on each side, one that'll add maybe four inches draft to the sail, and another one that'll add uh, eight inches. So that when he eases his outhaul when reaching, or even light air going to windward, he can get some good draft in the foot of the sail. 
right. course, you can. You, there's nothing you can do about the loss of area by pushing the, the the boom up to get draft when reaching. But the added fullness to the sail is is a lot more valuable than having the full area. At the same time, we want to have a good leech line in here, run forward to the mast so we can control the leech of the the large roach of the sail, particularly when reaching. You wanted to heat it down to a minimum of about, <clears throat> I should say a maximum of four head zones. I was wondering how we should uh, handle this situation for the next step down. Well, you go from the drifter to this four and a half ounce number one, and then the next thing is really, uh, I think all he needs to go to is a number two and a half general, shall we call it? It'll go oh, from the 20 to 30 knots with a double reef, and then a Number two jib uh, for really shot a left down about in here somewhere yeah. and keep mm -hmm. keep a still yeah, keep a good foot right yeah he definitely okay. wants the stretchy luff mm -hmm. and it's indicated his ship is up in here I, I think yeah. we can allow a little bit oh, more yeah. here for maximum area yeah. the stretchy left sail is made similar to the wire left sail but in place of wire a rope is used which will come and go with the strain on the halyard. A stretchy left Genoa can be made fuller by easing off the tension on the left. And by increasing the tension on the left, the sail becomes flatter. On a stretchy left Genoa, adjustments for variations in wind strength can be made by the halyard rather than the sheet. As the wind increases, the halyard is tightened to flatten the Genoa and narrow up the slot between mainsail and Genoa. As the wind decreases, the halyard is eased off and the space between mainsail and Genoa becomes greater with a fuller Genoa. We have a big foot skirt. Even we, well, we might even put a foot line in it to keep it from flapping when reaching. We can have a short, short tack pin in here that can be used uh, when you're reaching. In other words, uh, instead of easing the halyard off to make the sail fuller, we can let the tack pin go up, get the sail up in the air, and then the foot of the sail will clear the lifelines. And we'll have to naturally he'll move the lead aft too. This gives you a fuller sail, clears the lifelines, gets the area up in the air. Yeah, with the size you've got here, it looks like you, you know, you'll be able to well, come up there 15, 16 more inches. Well, on this lap, you'll probably get to, what, up to 18 inches of adjustment between heaviest air and the light air, which will give him plenty to clear his lifelines. Right. And, uh, and then under those conditions, when he's uh, when he's all the way up, he's he's uh, he'll be moving his lead point further aft mm -hmm. to uh, keep his trim angle right. You don't want to forget to tell him about that we're making the leech straight and, and that this is going to give him a very temperamental leech that's going to need con constant adjustment of the leech line. The leech of a Genoa looks best when the mainsail is down. As the mainsail is hoisted and filled, the slot effect is created between the two sails. A vacuum is sucking the Genoa into the mainsail, causing a lump, and the leech flutters. The leech line has to be constantly adjusted to stop this fluttering. But it is much better to have this odd-looking curvature in the leech of the sail and know that you have a vacuum than to have a nice smooth-looking leech such as you have without the mainsail.
board a boat and making the sails do what you want them to do. Get the most out of the wind.